be here now. Just be here now. I don't think I would be who I am without these uh, chemically induced experiences and uh, beyond the experiences themselves, the new pathways that they open up for you to continually contemplate well beyond a substance being in your body um, is invaluable. And the conversations that are born from working with these plant medicines, just like how it contributes to your perspective of society as a whole or or government systems or um, even just having like a a conversation with you today about advocacy. um, It's really amazing how They just open up your mind and your heart and, um, yeah, open you up to a, a fuller, a fuller time, a fuller time on this, on this planet. Welcome to the Set and Setting Podcast with Madison Margolin. As a journalist, Madison has spent years exploring the intersection of psychedelics, cannabis, and culture. This podcast brings together thought leaders from today's psychedelic renaissance to talk about the role of psychedelics in our inner and outer lives. You can support this podcast and find additional resources at BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Madison. Hi, everyone. I'm Madison Margolin, and welcome back to the Set and Setting podcast. We have with us Brooke Bergstaller. She's a writer, producer, host, and actress in television, online media, and film. She specializes in quote-unquote edutainment, so educational entertainment, um, with the daily cannabis news show World of Weed, as well as their cannabis wellness startup, Budding Mind. Brooke, thank you so much for being here. Aloha, Madison. Thank you for having me. So um, I've known you for a while, and I've known your work for a while, and you've always been you know, a cannabis advocate. You've also done a little bit of work with us with Double Blind, hosting our How to Grow Mushrooms um, educational course speaking of edutainment. Um, but yeah. how, how did you kind of get into this world? Well, first by consuming cannabis and dabbling with psychedelics and uh, having a general interest in these things. And ultimately, just crossing paths with opportunities. In a lot of ways, I feel very blessed and very guided to work with cannabis and other plant medicines and um, be a voice for these things because things have appeared in my in my pathway. And so I met you at Mary Jane, Snoop Dogg's media, cannabis media company, and started making news for them. And it was a really adorable process and kind of a traditional entry point. I literally like auditioned for the show. And then when I started working for them, I was like, wait, hold on. You're going to pay me to talk about weed? Uh, it was a pretty phenomenal <laughs> experience. And that really opened my mind to... Like, oh, well, you can kind of carve out whatever you want in this existence. And I've just continued down that road. Cool. And, <laughs> and there's my you- dog. Hi. <laughs> I wish it's a podcast. So I wish the people <laughs> who's, who are listening could see your dog, but there's also going to be a Zoom. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Well. Check out the video, guys. She's very proud. <laughs> <laughs> she is standing there like that. So before you even got into cannabis, you, I mean, you're like, you're, you're an actress, right? So you like, mm-hmm. what was your background before? And I feel like the reason I'm asking is I've, I've actually interviewed people who are in entertainment and they talk about sort of the, the spiritual practice of like putting, you know, taking on character or like being before an audience. So I was kind of curious how you, you know, how you got into ed- entertainment in general. And then, you know, we'll go from there. Like what inspired you to do it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got into entertainment because I'm a general ham, you know, series of life traumas led me to needing external validation by way of sense of humor. And, um, (laughs) you know, that's the God is honest truth. um, uh, Yeah, so I, I, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be an actress and I moved out to Los Angeles in pursuit of the great dream. And I certainly thought, I went to college in Miami for journalism and theater But I always wanted to be an actress, and my parents wouldn't let me just move out to L.A. They insisted on me getting a college education, gratefully so. But when I moved to L.A., I absolutely thought, like, oh, in about three weeks, I'm going to be on a CW show with vampires, and I'm going to be, 
you know, living that life and was served several helpings of humble pie over the years, realizing that um, your plan A sometimes requires a plan B. And that's really like, you know, the gift from the universe is wanting to pursue acting and comedy and all these things out here in Los Angeles ultimately led me to working for companies like Mary Jane, et cetera, working in the cannabis space and being able to kind of be an entertainer in this new arena of possibilities. And um, these things intertwine in a very interesting way because when I started working in cannabis, I was very nervous that it was going to negatively impact my acting opportunities, that somehow someone, a casting director for Disney was going to see me talking about weed and they were going to, it was going to be a no-go. Um, I don't think that ever happened. I don't think Disney was ever like, oh, we can't hire Brooke. I don't think they ever knew who I was and that ship has sailed <laughs> at 31 years of age. So uh, I think I, I'm safe now to comfortably be out of the cannabis closet, but that still waxes and wanes in a lot of ways um, in pursuit of other opportunities outside of cannabis. I've gotten a lot of advice that has conflicted with the expression of my truest self that has, um, I've really gotten advice from people to like, be, stop talking about weed. <laughs> Even stop still? being so vocal. Still, oh yeah. Like quite recently, um, someone in the like hosting space was like, "Brooke, you really. If I was a producer, I would look at your socials and I would say, well, this girl's going to be too high to get to set, and I don't want to hire her.'" Wow. And I was like, damn, you're 50. Let me give you a break. <laughs> you don't get it. But uh, yeah, baby, stigma is strong. And uh, that's just the the push and pull of, you know, it's a, it's like a really beautiful challenge, though, because I have to balance like who, who I really am with who I perceive I need to be to gain certain opportunities and um, hopefully choose the former over and over again. But it is a, mm-hmm. it is a challenge to… Well, yeah. you are… I mean, you are really vocal about cannabis on your social media. But so much of that, you know, and the way that I've experienced your social media is like this reverence for the plant and this, you know, like you've said before and you can kind of correct me or finesse the language, like how cannabis really helps you be who you are and like what you know, you have a very deep relationship with, with often I think you'll say her, right? Or like kind of personifying (laughs) cannabis is like your baby, you're a cannabis plant mom, you know? So what, you know, like how is it that cannabis is really, or psychedelics or, you know, altered states have really helped you kind of step into yourself as kind of the truest expression or allowed you to kind of find yourself in its truest, in your truest expression and then, you know, go forth in the world? Mm. Well, definitely beginning my plant medicine journey, it all started with cannabis when I was in college and I was an alcoholic as many are. Again, I went to school in Miami. So uh, binge drinking was my pastime. And when I was like really introduced to cannabis in a very consistent manner, I, it like led me into a much healthier, like physical state because I, I, stopped partying so much. And in that pause, it helped me to, I had more space to think and to consider my actions. And, um, I, I largely attribute like my healthy lifestyle beginning with cannabis in those moments, really thinking about like, what am I putting in my body? Uh, okay. And if I'm putting like, what food am I putting in my body? Well, then what shampoos and and soaps am I putting in my body? And what chemicals am I using in my house? And where is my weed being grown? And uh, just letting that snowball kind of cover my my whole existence. And, you know, I'm not perfect, but um, so yeah, that's that's cannabis for you. And and I really feel like I don't, I, well, I do smoke weed every day. Who am I kidding? I wanted to be like, no, I don't even use it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but who cares if you do? If you're like a functional person who's kind of getting things done, then what's Thank the you. cannabis every day? I needed some, I needed some validation. Thank you, medicine. But, um, <laughs> you know, cannabis then created new neural pathways in my brain and um, made me a more open-minded individual. And 
I think there's like a really precious time when dabbling with cannabis or other plant medicines, like when you are younger and you have less worries in the world and you have less like blockages in in your perspectives and um, you can just be more open to whatever the experiences bring. So I was really fortunate to not just journey with cannabis in my younger years, but also with psychedelics and um, just having like a complete curiosity, just going in like quite naive and not knowing what these experiences were going to bring me. And I believe as a result of that, they brought me like, they like cracked me wide open. And, you know, these, these are, these are beautiful medicines that help chisel away little bits and pieces of your untruths to bring you a little bit closer into home. And I'm endlessly grateful. And as you said, like endlessly reverent for these things to exist on the same planet as me and for them to really like call to you and and to feel the strength and the courage to uh, respond to the call is a very, a very exciting thing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I guess my question is, you know, I'm thinking of the the person who gave you that advice or sort of the the critics out there is, <laughs> you know, like in in um, singing the praises of cannabis and like how cannabis has worked for you and how it works for so many other people, like there is also kind of a shadow side to mm-hmm. psychedelics and cannabis. And so like, how do you acknowledge that or advocate, you know, how do you make sure that your advocacy kind of encompasses all aspects of the experience. Yeah, is authentic. I think that's something really interesting as I dive deeper into the cannabis space, even being at MJ BizCon, I'm like, whoa, this is not, we're not talking about a plant here. This is full-blown business through and through. This is suits. This is capitalism. This is commercialism. And that's fine. That's inevitable. Um, and, and it's going to happen with psychedelics too. And it's going to be a fascinating thing to observe because it's in such opposition to like what is the inherent consciousness of these, these substances. But uh, there's that, there's like a term in the environmental communities of greenwashing where advertisements will like, yeah, Coca-Cola will like turn their label green and they'll be like, we're now using pure cane sugar. And everyone's <laughs> like, oh my God, Coca-Cola is doing such great work in the world. Uh, <laughs> and I really, I do apply that to the cannabis phase too, especially being a content creator. Like, you know, sometimes a brand is paying me to sing their praises. And then sometimes I feel really schmarmy about it because I'm like, well, we get into such a habit of greenwashing in this space of saying like, oh, well, if you have any body pain, you should smoke weed. Oh, well, you need, you have like a a backache. You should probably smoke weed. You have a headache. You should smoke weed. You have anxiety. Weed will probably fix that. PTSD, depression, all of these things. We just like make an assumption because being in the cannabis space, you want to support the forward momentum of this, this plant. You want to keep it moving in a positive direction that everyone's very nervous to say anything negative. And I think there needs to be more space for that because there is no one size fits all. Like not everyone should, like my mom is allergic to, um, what is it? Amoxicillin. Hmm. Like, okay, so she can't take that when she's sick. Like, that's fine. Some people can't take things when they're sick. Like I also wouldn't ever want my mom to trip balls. Like I don't think that's right for her in this (laughs) lifetime. So uh, yeah, there's like, there's a a big need for a more well-rounded like persona put out into the world for, for all of these substances, I think. And while I obviously believe in them and have deep relationships with them, I think it's okay to say that like, yeah, sometimes people get sick from too much weed. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes maybe you shouldn't smoke weed when you're pregnant. Maybe like maybe maybe that's okay. <laughs> maybe right. you shouldn't smoke weed if you have debilitating anxiety. Maybe it's not for you and like that's totally acceptable. It doesn't mean that I hate the plant. <laughs> well, I mean, I would say and you know, you, again, like tell speak to your own experience here too is like the good and the bad, um, or the the good and the challenging, I should say, with any sort of like mm. uh, altered state experience, whether it's cannabis or psychedelic or whatever, is still teaching you something about yourself. 
So even if you're going through something uncomfortable and you say to yourself, okay, I'm not doing that again, you still kind of like learned about, you know, what triggers your anxiety or, you know, like what was it about that discomfort that actually, you know, gave you information about yourself and really like whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that you're experiencing, you know, in this altered state, like it's really setting you on your path to just kind of express who you are when you're not high or, you know, just, you know, like you said, chisel away at these untruths about yourself. And then, you know, really it's just helping you discover yourself in, you know, different light, different, different brain states, different perspectives. It makes things bubble up that are already within you. And that can be really annoying to confront. (laughs) I mean, you know, like look at exactly. I mean, look at also Ramdas's experience, right? Like he had all of these psychedelic experiences and then you know, it's not that necessarily they went bad, but he was like, okay, like this isn't serving me in the way that, you know, in in the way that uh, Timothy Leary might proselytize that it's serving you. Um, And, you know, he ends up in India with his guru and, but, you know, Ramdas is who he is or was who he was because of his psychedelic experience. There's no way around that. And, you know, to say otherwise, like, oh, well, like the path, is, the meditation path is better than the psychedelic path. Mm. You know, I don't think it's like a better or a worse. It's just like for time and place, right? So like Ramdas needed his psychedelic path, which didn't even necessarily end when he, you know, discovered Maharaji, but like he needed that path in order to then like become who he was after that. So, you know, and you, and you said something just now that was like, um, how psychedelics kind of cracked you open a little bit. Is, is that is that the terminology you, you use? <laughs> or opened you yes. up or okay. Yes. <laughs> so what what did you what do you mean by that? Or like what can you speak to that a little bit more when you know what your initial experiences were? Expanded perspectives. I mean, really just and it's it all kind of sounds cliche in, in some ways, but seeing seeing things for the first time, like just I remember the first time I took mushrooms and I was laying on the floor of like a jungle in Miami and my friend Spencer started freaking out that there was a bee around him. There were several bees and I could hear them, but I was intoxicated. (laughs) So I was just like, yo, I was not much of a friend. I was like, good luck over there. But him talking about the bees and kind of panicking about the bees prompted my mind probably one of like the strongest hallucinations I've ever had from psilocybin was my body was covered in bees, completely covered in swarming bees. And I had a choice. I was presented with a choice in my mind in that moment of like panic or allow. And fortunately, for whatever reason, I was like really curious about it. I was like, whoa, that's not real. Yet it's real, but that's Wow, I can just kind of like embrace this experience and embrace this weirdness and this wildness. And that taught me so much about my own brain and my own mental patterns and my like just how I observe life. And there's just so many golden nuggets throughout psychedelic experiences where it's um, just like shown me you can go this way or that way. And in a moment, making making a choice and, uh, and seeing what unfolds. And yeah, I, and, and a lot of growth has happened in recent years through my experiences with ayahuasca, which has been like a whole other layer of, uh, wait, that's there. (laughs) What? (laughs) Growing up, you know, (laughs) girl, I was obsessed with Sabrina, the teenage witch. Did you think that would enter its way into our interview today? Probably not. (laughs) Like obsessed. I had so many books on Wicca when I was younger. I was like enamored with this idea that like I could be a real witch. Like I could point with my finger and crazy shit will happen. <laughs> and uh, journeying with psychedelics and particularly ayahuasca, I I realized like, oh, the magic that I have dreamed of existed on this planet does. Not in the forms that I thought it did. Not in this like made for TV <laughs> talking cat way, but in this 
like, I mean, way deeper, way more layered, way more mystical way. And I don't think I would be who I am without these uh, chemically induced experiences. And uh, beyond the experiences themselves, the new pathways that they open up for you to continually contemplate well beyond a substance being in your body um, is invaluable. And the conversations that are born from working with these plant medicines, just like how it contributes to your perspective of society as a whole or or government systems or um, even just having like a a conversation with you today about advocacy. um, It's really amazing how they just open up your mind and your heart and, um, yeah, open you up to a, a fuller, a fuller time, a fuller time on this, on this planet. Mm -hmm. So one thing I was, you know, I was curious about, and, you know, it's like when you see someone who's such a light, which you are, you know, who's positive and like really doing things in the world and functional and, you know, <laughs> you know like... It, you don't know that. <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 functional enough, I'll say, <laughs> you know, functional enough for me not to know that. Um, but, you know, someone who like is just, you know, is really like doing life and, it, and whatever, like life, life works for them. You know, I, I say to myself, okay, like, what is their practice? Like, how, what time do they wake up in the morning? Like, do they meditate? What do they eat? Do they exercise? Like, you know, are they smoking cannabis? Or, you know, what's their relationship to psychedelics? So I'm, you know, in your case, and again, I'm I'm saying this, like, as as a friend, but also someone who's, who knows you as a colleague and, like, admires your work and is inspired by that. Like, what, it, like, it's whatever is wor- you're doing, it seems like it's working. So what what are you doing exactly? You know, like, what is your wow. practice, your wellness practice? The lies of the internet. Just kidding. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, I I wake up every morning at 5 a.m. and I scrape my tongue. Um, <laughs> I had a friend really tell me, she was like, I got a tongue scraper because all of the most successful people in the world, they wake up and they scrape their tongue in the morning. I was like, I don't think that has anything to do with success or productivity, but I'm happy for your oral bacteria. Um, <laughs> anyways... <laughs> My personal practice, you know, it waxes and wanes. Like I, and I think especially as women, that's really important to allow things to change and to shift because I have had like a really rigid approach to a morning practice many times in my life. My morning miracle, I will wake up at 7 a.m. and I will, I will journal, I will read, I will exercise, I will meditate, I will visualize and I will affirm uh, and I will do all these things for 10 minutes each and every morning. Uh, And when I do do that in life, when I like dedicate myself to a really a consistent and strong practice, I see great things unfold. And it's a really helpful reset when I am feeling particularly bogged down by life. And um, the discipline component, I think, is like this. It's so beautiful and it's so challenging. And uh, it's something I battle with. But when I can get into the flow of of that consistent morning practice, it is glorious, but that doesn't happen every week or every day. So I have had to allow myself to um, rid some of that guilt of like, God, it's 7 a.m. And like, I promised myself I would get up and meditate, but like, I want to sleep for another hour. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really important to like, that needs to be part of the spiritual practice too, is it doesn't have to look the same every day. So like, you're okay. Yeah. (laughs) Doing something every day for yourself or for your soul or for just taking a moment to pause and breathe and, and connect with the universe or the greater belonging, um, that that is enough. But if you want to dive deeper and you want to see growth, I do think committing yourself to a practice is really a special and, and beautiful thing. And um, so right now, what that looks like for me, like right now, is I meditate for 15 to 20 minutes when I can. Mm-hmm. Um Ideally, in the morning, I one of the things that I, I really am trying to do lately is right before I go to bed and right when I wake up, really talk nice to myself. Like even if my brain is is falling into sleep or I'm just waking up and I'm not fully present, like trying to control those first thoughts the minute I feel my mind turning on. And it took me a minute to figure that out to like wrangle that in and harness the ability to do that. Uh, But I think that's a really 
really sweet and gentle practice, like right when I wake up, like, okay, my bed is so comfortable. Like, I'm going to have a good day. This is going to be great, Brooke. <laughs> you can do it. Get the fuck out of bed. <laughs> And uh, I listen to a lot of positive affirmations. I don't know if you know Louise Hay, but she is the grandma I never had and (laughs) gets me through my days. Um, I love that so much. I listen to tons of podcasts. Tara Brock is like one of my greatest teachers in this life. And I listen to a bevy of audiobooks. And um, I, I do think it's, I definitely think it's important to be in control of what you put into your psyche. And I would say that's probably like my number one practice is like, I don't watch scary, scary things. I don't watch a lot of content in general as an actress. I'm not watching much TV. Mm-hmm. That's weird. Um, <laughs> I, I don't watch TV either, to be honest. I'm not an actress. Yeah. Things yeah. Don't, they're not as captivating as I'd like them to be. So I, I try not to waste too much time just staring at a, at a screen. Just kidding. I stare at my phone all the time. But, um, you know, the my, my rituals, they evolve and they change and I, I learn new practices and incorporate them for as long as they last, as long as I can hold on to them. And um, I think that's, that's part of, yeah, as I mentioned, that's part of my practice is letting it, letting it change and morph. But, um, oh, and another thing that I really love, and this I, I do when I'm high, on anything, if I'm feeling nervous, is like I tap. Mm. That's a really beautiful thing to do is just tapping on your heart, tapping on different acupuncture points on your head to calm you down. But um, I appreciate you acknowledging that I look like I have my shit together, but like everyone else or not everyone else, um, but some other people, I have a lot of anxiousness running through my system. And so uh, sometimes it's like a daily thing to have to combat that and, and find my most grounded self. And sometimes I don't accomplish that till the end of the day. And sometimes Mm -hmm. I don't accomplish it at all. And I just spend a couple hours crying and, um, and that's, I have to let that be okay. And I know that there is, we're just, we're these beautiful little onions and I'm really excited to be 31 years old with this whole toolbox of different practices to help myself now, um, I'm really excited to see what I'll be like at 50 years old as I continually learn and continually absorb and put better and better things into my body and mind. And um, I hope that, you know, that evolution is ever upward. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate you just kind of like being real about that. Um, <laughs> you know, just like that part of the practice is that, oh, I, I just spent two hours crying just because, you know, I got overwhelmed and I'm anxious today. Yeah. And and it's so hard. I mean, I find that it's so hard to sort of like break our, break free of this productivity mindset, even as it applies to wellness and practice. You know, it's like I, I'm trying to get myself to like do the things. I, I have an app where I, where I put down like, take my vitamins. Did you drink enough water? <laughs> Like, you know, did you exercise today? Did you sweat? Did I meditate? Did I read? Did I journal? Did I do like all of these things that, you know, I- Checking off the box. Yeah. But then I realized like literally why I'm not doing it to check off a box. Like, yes, I want to keep myself accountable to like, to doing, to doing the things that get me into flow state or help me be, you know, a healthy person. But- you know, then when I start to guilt myself or feel bad about myself because I didn't check off enough boxes on my app, you know, like, and and then it's like, <laughs> it's, it's using the same mentality and the same mindset that I use in work or in capitalism where it's like, oh, did you check off the boxes of like, did you pay your rent? Did you make enough money this month? Mm-hmm. Did you, you know, write, I mean, and you know, I guess we're both kind of like journalist creative people. Like, did I write enough things or did you record enough, you know, content or whatever it is? And like, you know, I think so much of, of a practice is like, you know, decolonizing our minds from the uh, uh, like emotional trips that we lay on ourselves um, for, you know, that get us through kind of society as it is, which is for better or for worse. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of guilt that we put on ourselves. Yeah, for sure. And the more you the more you learn, the more practices that you learn about, the more the more books people tell you about, you're like, oh my God, I have to add that to my list. And right. uh, 
you know, it, it's all it's all good stuff. But part of the challenge as a truly, I guess, like as a, a conscious individual is realizing. And as we were talking about cannabis, like there is the shadow aspect. There is pain living inside of all of us. And like that needs to be embraced, not swept under the rug. Like that needs to be sat with and looked at. And it might not, this, this audio book, this meditation practice, this video that you watched on YouTube, this Ted talk might not be the thing that gives you the aha (laughs) that like fixes it all. There's no fix it button. Um, and that's life, baby. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'll i say like a, f- a few years ago, I was um, when I was in New York, or I mean, I'm still kind of back and forth to New York, <laughs> but I was, I was living in Brooklyn and I s- discovered these sort of like basement jams. Um, and they New were- New York, like, man. <laughs> yeah. It was, I mean, I guess it happens anywhere, but it was like a really specific um, scene where it was kids who were coming from like religious backgrounds and they were jamming in this basement in Williamsburg and like getting high off of like they were just reaching these ecstatic states like singing these these songs that were like in Hebrew or Yiddish and you know like I've been to jams like you know my whole life basically right like I've they, you know thank god I have friends who are just musically oriented and I just got to hang out with them but what I observed in this was like the, these kids getting into flow state in a way that I'd never seen before. And like, they were just like so gone, but in like the most beautiful way. And I don't mean gone by like, they were so gone by actually just being so present and like, so mm-hmm. in that. And, you know, like I said to myself at the time and I was like really hustling and like, you know, it was kind of, you know, the semi beginning of my journalism career. And I, you know, I, I had so much anxiety about how it would come together and work out. And then I said, if, like what's like the point of life is to like get into this flow state. Like the these kids, whatever they're doing with themselves, and again, like, you know, who knows what the rest of their lives look like. And I'm sure they have their own anxieties <laughs> and struggles and whatever. But like if you're not getting to that point like ever, then what is the point of everything else? Right. So, you know, if you're not enjoying the process, if you're not finding these moments of like of, you know, of just like kind of ecstatic flow state bliss that which then enables you to then go off and like do the things in the world and contribute like then what are you doing and so my question for you is like you know when you ta- taking like Ram Dass's Be Here Now or it's, it doesn't necessarily the concept doesn't belong to Ram Dass, but taking the concept of Be Here Now and and flow state like how do you get into flow state like what is something that just like you know puts you in that mode so to speak Mm. or just the mode of well, like I want to go to those now. yeah you want to go to those jams jam <laughs> sessions sound amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> as you were you were sharing I imagined like in flow state what I think I really feel like as I'm like I'm like breaking off and floating with the universe and the purpose of those experiences is to uh, pull back a little bit of the the goodness of the universe with you into those moments when you're not in flow state. And um, like yoga is a huge, that's my entry point uh, to total presence and forever grateful to have found that practice. I'm not, I never grew up as much of like a physical person. I'm not particularly coordinated. Um, My parents see me doing yoga. They're like, really? You, you like run into doors and you trip all the time. What's going on? But man, she can hold tree pose. And um, so, so that's like, that's, uh, and, and I've heard that in a lot of different ways, of course, that like physical practice is a beautiful way. Embodiment is a you can drop into your centered self, into the moment, um, mind, body, total coherence. And uh, yeah, being in a yoga class, and, and it doesn't always start off that way, which I think is interesting. And I'd be curious about other people's flow state experiences, whether it be through music or, or writing or, or whatever. But is there that like entry point of resistance in some ways? Because a lot of times, in yoga, sometimes I, I roll out my mat and I'm like, thank God I'm here right from the beginning. But a lot of times I'm like, 
God, this is kind of hard. Like, oh my gosh, am I sure I want to do this? Like, am I really going to finish this hour and a half long class? And then at the end of class, (laughs) I didn't even know that I was in this totally fluid place of, um, of just like allowing of just pure, pure soul embodiment. And, um, yeah, it is such a treasure and it's so beautiful. And I really do admire (laughs) people who seem to operate in that state with a bit more frequency, but, um, yeah, that's what being human's all about, man. And you know what? I also have moments, and I'm, I'm wondering if you do, Madison. Like, I tell my friends sometimes, I'm like, do you ever yeah. feel like you're tripping when you're not tripping? Like, psychedelics mm-hmm. somehow unlock these new ways of thinking or, or of looking at a tree or of, of looking at a flower. Or I'll, I'll just have moments driving where I'm like, wow, wow, like, wow, here I am. Here I am driving. Here are these beautiful palm trees and this lovely sunny California day, like just feeling deep love and reverence for the mundane of a moment. And a lot of times I feel like psychedelics have kind of um, unlocked that ability in me. So sometimes I try to enter into a flow state, I guess is what I'm saying. And sometimes I feel like it finds me and both feel really great. (laughs) Yeah, I... I definitely have those moments where, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I'm like just about to do a psychedelic and I'll be like, I don't know if I need this. You know, I'm like, I, you know, it's sometimes it feels superfluous for me. And what I mean by that is like, I'll already be enjoying the day, right? Like I'll already be in nature with friends and listening to music and like rolling around on the grass doing yoga and dancing. And I'm like, I'm doing the things already. So Am I trying to like, you know, I mean, there's a time and place for everything. Like, is being on mushrooms going to enhance this experience or am I now going to spend an hour and a half feeling a little bit nauseous? No, like, totally. And and like kind of navigating this. I mean, not not to say that the whole mushroom experience is about nausea. But, you know, I'll say to myself, like, I'm already having a great time and I'm already like kind of having great conversations. And so, you know, what like what is it adding? And I think to be able to like step back and look at your experience and then, um, and, and to have those moments, like when you said, when you're driving the car, like, you know, pretty sober moments where you're like, wow, life (laughs) is really interesting and life is really happening. And it's so surreal and it's reality. You know, like I think maintaining that perspective is, is great. Like that's the point. Like that's what psychedelics can really like, Um, Like you said, like unlock that perspective. And then it's not that the psychedelics become superfluous after you've like figured that out, quote unquote. But it's like then you can be intentional in different ways that how you then incorporate cannabis or psychedelic. And you say like, how and why am I using this? Because life is already psychedelic. So (laughs) how do I want to like then work with that energy to you know, for whatever. And I, you know, the one thing as I was saying before, um, when it was like using this kind of like work related capitalist mindset for my wellness practice and people Mm -hmm. always have like an intention with not always, but like people say to have an intention when you do a psychedelic because it'll like enhance the experience. And there's whole like, well, what am I getting out of it? You know, what's the point? If I'm not going to get anything out of it, like, should I even do it? And Mm -hmm. I think there's like two approaches to the to taking psychedelics, there's the intentional, like, I want to work on my trauma today or, you know, my anxiety. And then there's, you know, the more kind of casual, you know, like, hey, it's like a beautiful Saturday afternoon and everyone's taking mushrooms and it would just be so nice to add that into the to the vibe of what's happening. And it doesn't have to be for like this big, like, you know, this big personal psychological intention. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, you know, I think just like balancing like the, the emphasis and the expectation that you put on it. Um, I don't know if that even answers your question here. That was beautifully said. (laughs) Totally. I, it's funny. I, I mean, people think I smoke weed and do psychedelics like way more than I do. Um, I mean, I, granted I probably 
have way more experience than the average person. But. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> most likely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, but I, I think that's a really beautiful thing about you as a journalist is that like objectivity of that, like you're not forcing a point. You have a genuine curiosity and an ability to like zoom out. Mm-hmm. You don't need there to be a specific story or outcome or you don't need everyone to feel a certain way that you do about something. You can just like allow – tell just tell the story. Right. Like allow their own to feelings be what it, it is. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I think that's, that's kind of what psychedelics help you do though is like when something is just – when something just – when something is how it is, you can just make peace with it. You know, like it is okay. And I think that's – so much of, again, I'm also, I have a lot of anxiety, you know, like that's, that is the thing that I deal with is trying to so like fun. <laughs> regulate my nervous system. Um, yeah, like an, allowing myself to just like, I don't know, I kind of lost my train of thought with this one, but yeah, like, so I think psychedelics like just say like, this is life. This is how life is. Like here it is. It's beautiful. Like you can kind of see your life in this like snow globe. I've, I've had that experience in ayahuasca. Wow. Like it's so precious and it's it's like, you know, it's encapsulated and it's in a precious glass and like it can just be broken, but it's also so beautiful and intricate and like mm-hmm. has all these details. So just like hold it and care for it and just let it be what it is, you know? Yeah. Try not to drop it. But if you do, even that's beautiful. Look yeah. The glitter and glass on the ground now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean… <laughs> Oh gosh, I mean that's still a scary prospect if we're talking about life in the metaphor of a snow globe. But it's broken. Oh god. But yeah, yeah. So so anyways, so okay, so how, you know, is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you want to add or discuss or go over? You know what? Actually, yeah, just uh something beautiful if if anyone is listening and curious about dabbling with with plant medicines. One of the greatest gifts that I've also been given through these experiences and what what really prompted my openness to all of these things, because I understand that they are scary and now there's so many experts coming out in the field. And so as someone who's, who's new and, and doesn't know anything about cannabis or mushrooms or acid, and then um, it can be intimidating. It can feel like, what's the point for me to even give it a go? Um, Am I going to do it right? Is it is it for me? I can't answer any of those questions. But I will say I have gratitude for what prompted me on my spiritual journey, which is um, losing my brother Taylor. He passed away. And <laughs> the connection I feel to him and to – like I, I've stopped – like not even calling it the universe or the source or whatever, just like the greater belonging. Just knowing that like maybe we all have our own snow globes, but we're all part of like a way bigger snow globe. And um, I guess I just wanted to add that like this is – it's been such a gift to know – to know sometimes that I'm safe and I'm part of it all. And that is because of plant medicines. They have given me the gift of – of that feeling, of that comfort, of that knowing that I am part of it all. And sometimes I, my ego self wants to challenge that and say, that's not true. You're not special. That's not, life's not that special. Uh, but it really, it really, really is. And I'm, for the rest of this lifetime at least, indebted to these experiences and these plants. And um, I appreciate you, Madison, for giving me a place to talk about it today. Of course. Thank you for sharing everything. This was, you know, I like, I just love talking to you. <laughs> you, know, hey, you too. <laughs> you're just like always so open and say it how it is, you know? So. Wow. So, well, I appreciate that. Yeah. 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 So where can people find you um, like on social media, find your work, like just right on. what's the, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I exist primarily on Instagram and, uh, exist primarily on Instagram. Yeah. As that's where I live. <laughs> yeah. So you can find me at Brooke Steller. You can also find cannabis and wellness content at Budding Mind and daily cannabis news at World of Weed News. And for everything else, just send me a telepathic message and I guess I'll let you know if I get it. (laughs) All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brooke. Thank you, Madison.